Good. Let's get us started then. Um, okay. Uh, let's uh, keep going for today. Um, going to finish what we were talking uh, about uh, last time, um, that I almost finished uh, the algorithm for recognizing facial expressions. Well, actually, facial action units, right? Uh, facial muscle articulations. So let's finish this very quickly. Then I'll review some more details of uh, emotion recognition uh, in particular. And then we'll uh, go back to object recognition as our object recognition two. Uh, session. Okay. All right. So now for classification, we had already constructed in our previous lecture the face space to define action units, and now we want to do recognition of these action units. So um, here we're going to have a training set X that is going to be composed of, and this is this math cal X, right, uh, of subsets X I i from 1 to capital C, see the number of categories. So if we're using action units and you have, you want to recognize 20 different action units, then C is going to be 20. And then for each of this, these subsets xi are going to be um, this uh, zi1 that we have defined right before. zi1 and yi1 all the way to Z-I-N-I, Y-I-N-I, right? And then Z-I-N-I plus one, Y-I-N-I plus one, and all the way to Z-I-M minus N-I, and Y-I-M minus N-I. And what this represents, remember from our last lecture, that we have the different uh, representations, the ZIs for the images that we have constructed, or the, excuse me, the feature space that we have represent, that we have used to represent the images, right? And so this ZI had both the shape information and the shading information of the face, right? Of the landmark points, around the landmark points. And then yi now is going to be either 1 or 0. It's going to be a binary output, uh, or 1 and negative 1, right? So you could have positive 1, negative 1, 1, 0, whatever other combination that you want to, but a binary output uh, that corresponds to the first ni are going to be the ones that, ha that are images with that action unit present in that facial expression. And the other ones, uh, the other M ones, right, that are here, are going to be the ones that do not have that action unit present in the image, right? So you have uh, that many that are, and that many that are not uh, showing the presence of that action unit, which means that this is the set, or the training set, to be more precise, uh, of or for action unit I, right? And then again, to clarify these uh, yijs, right, they're going to be 1 if, um, or actually for j, 1 through ni and 0 uh, otherwise. Right? Make sense? All right, awesome. So that uh, we were at a step three, if I remember correctly, from our last lecture. So that would be step four, right? Create or organize this uh, training set. So this is uh, the uh, training set step. Then number five, we need to find a representation of each of these xi's, this mathcal xi using one of the methods that we have introduced before in class, right? So represent or define, if you prefer, uh, each xi using a known method. So for example, we could use PCA Right? We could use ICA, 
We could use LDA. We could use Laplacian phases. We could use um, tensor phases. We could use whatever method that we wish uh, to use to represent the, the, either the subspace or the distribution right, of that action unit. Make sense? Um, typically, people will use uh, nonlinear extensions of those. And I don't cover those in computer vision, but these are covered, covered in my machine learning class. So most of you have taken that course or will take it at a later time. And if not, in the meantime, you have the YouTube lectures uh, that, uh, uh, that have these uh, descriptions, uh, excuse me, this presentation of these extensions uh, of all these methods. So you have a, what's called a kernel or nonlinear uh, PCA. Uh, kernel version for LDA, so you'll see as K, PCA many times, and K, LDA. There's another method I introduced, SDA, that's subclass discrete analysis, and it's extension that works really well for this problem, and so on. So you have all these nonlinear extensions of these methods that are typically used for this. And then finally, number six, uh, classification is given by the class distribution uh, or the subspace, if that's what we've computed, uh, given by five. So, uh, for example, right, this is just an example. Uh, we could have, uh, so classification. Be given by the argument that minimizes uh, a, say, the two norm, for example, right? So we could have the Z test. Um, and I'm going to say phi i. This phi i means that this Z test, Z is the feature vector of the test image, right? Projected in whichever of these spaces that I have decided to, uh, to use, right? PCA, K KPCA, ICA, what have you, uh, minus the mean, for example, right, uh, of that class, right? So you're looking for the closest mean j, and that is going to give you uh, the class, right? Uh, for j here, it would be j1 through, we said c classes, right? Whoops. So uh, we're going to have 1 through c, capital C. Okay, any questions about this? So far so good? All right, the other obvious extension that we have uh, done for every other problem that we have seen is to use deep networks, right? Just another extension. So how about if we use deep nets? And uh, this is just a trivial extension, of course, at this point. So. Basically, what we can do here is um, to define um, a another feature vector. So, for example, if I have a face here, right? This is an image of a facial expression. Then I can associate this uh, x i vector to the to its corresponding y i output, expected output. And this is going to be a vector of ones and zeros, or negative ones and positive ones. So for example, it could be negative one, negative one, all the way to negative one, one, negative one, negative one, uh, to indicate that action unit i, right, it's active. And this would be in the ith look, uh, um, coordinate of that feature vector, right? OK, see how this works? So, yeah, question. You could have, do you have multiple? Of course, absolutely. You could have uh, multiple of those be positives, right? So you could have maybe two uh, uh, ones here, and then you'd have negative one and so forth, right? And they don't have to be consecutive. They can be whichever they are active. Very good. 
Um, and now, what do we need to do to design a deep neural network? We need to define uh, some function that we, right, some mapping function that we want to model. So in our case, we have f of our image i. So uh, actually, I call this xi. xi and our parameters w, right, the parameters of our network. And then what we want to do is to define this. This is a functional. This should be bolded f, right? So I'm just going to add an arrow here to indicate this is a a vector of functions, right? So this is going to be f1 of xi w1 and all the way to f, say, r of xi uh, wr transpose, right? And this is a function of functions. And each of these functions is going to give me an estimate, right? Each of these functions is going to give me an estimate of each of these um, outputs, right? So this is a, a um, this would be for AU1, this is for AU2, this one would be for AUR, right? So I have an R dimensional vector that specifies each of them and then I want to define a function that maps me to each of these binary classifiers, right? And with that, I can define my loss function that I need to optimize, or that my deep neural network needs to optimize. So I can define my loss function L as, let's see, 1 over R, the sum from J1 through R of, and I'm just going to use, and you, this is a trick in deep neural networks, right? How you define the loss function matters, right? I'm just going to use the classical least squares reconstruction loss or square loss. But you'll see many other alternatives uh, being used out there, right? So the obvious one is, of course, the least squares loss, which is f sub j of x i w uh, uh, minus uh, wj, or b, minus yij, right? And 2, 2. And this is my loss, right? And now I just uh, select a network, and I optimize for this, right? And that's it. Now, obviously, you're not restricted to do it this way, right? You could select any other metric. So let me probably just give you maybe one more metric or two, and we'll leave it at that. So uh, an alternative is to uh, compute, for example, uh, the difference between every pairs of AUs, right? So uh, difference between AU pairs. And that I could write it as the loss is, let's see, let's do the summing term first. Uh, every J that is smaller than K, now of course J has to be larger or equal than one, and K has to be smaller or equal than R, which are our minimum and maximum. And now I can do Fij by Fij, um, I'm just going to simplify notation here. Fij, I mean this Fj applied to the ith symbol, right, or image. Um, Fij minus Yij. And so this is the first one that I have over there, right? And now I'm going to subtract this from fik minus yik, right? And now here I can compute some p norm, right? And square that. And now I'm comparing the output of this with the output of this, right? And I'm interested in pairs because action units do not occur in isolation. I know that in the physical world, when I move the inner corners of the eyebrows up, typically I also raise the 
uh, outer corners of the eyebrows, right? So I want to create this correlation, and that would do that, right? And I need now to normalize by all the, the number of terms that I have here, and this is 2 uh, over r, r plus 1. And p, whatever p norm you want to select, obviously p uh, typically a norm, so larger than, uh, larger or equal than 1, or there might be some argument to using quasi-norms. Okay, now the classical architecture, network architecture that uh, we typically use for action units, and that's not set in stone, but this is what people use these days regularly. You use about uh, eight, nine, ten layers. Uh, the first layer usually, so I'll say the deep neural network uh, topology, topology or, or architecture, whatever you want to call it. Uh, say the first layer, actually let me do that here. I'm not going to have space. First layer is a convolutional layer, typically, and obviously <laughs> the size of the convolution, how many convolutions, how many kernels for that convolution, what's a stride rate, what's the size of the filter, right, or the kernel, all these things are up to you, right? Trial and error. Right now, there is no other mechanism to select these things, right? So usually you'll do a first a layer with a convolution, a second layer with max pooling. Remember, it's just taking the max operation. Uh, then you do another convolution. Then you do another max pooling. Uh, then you do another convolution, five, and then six, you do a, another convolution without doing the max pulling, and then seven and eight, they are both uh, fully connected layers. Okay. Uh, the typical uh, activation function in all of these layers that you're going to use um, is typically going to be the ReLU. Now remember the ReLU is um, that function w that has a zero if x is smaller than uh, zero, right? and x if x is larger than zero, right? Or equal, okay? So that just be the max between zero and x. That's rel, right? And so on and so forth. This is the classical. Now I have to say that for action unit recognition, this type of networks works about the same as using this uh, nonlinear versions of PCA, linear discriminant analysis, they are pretty much in power right now. There's no, no one that has proposed a deep neural network that works much, much better than classical approaches that we've been using. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Oh, two questions. Yeah. Is there any change with, uh, as far as speed or if you were to Oh, using this method is much faster. Yeah. Especially for training. Absolutely. Um, uh, much fewer resources are required. And the problem with these deep neural networks, first, and we'll talk more about this in the object recognition lecture, but um, there, there's two main problems. Number one, a string these neural networks is super expensive. I mean, like money expensive, right? <laughs> the amount of money you have to spend to train these things because the amount of uh, hardware that you need to run this and the time that it takes it's enormous. But after this is trained, these networks are massive. And you have to put it somewhere to run. It's not a network you could put in your cell phone, typically, right? It's a network that takes a massive amount of time. You could put it in the cloud. And that means that your technology has to go to the cloud, ask the cloud for an answer, right? Which takes time. Uh, these other methods are much, much, much more efficient, right? 
So uh, you can, we have, uh, in my lab, we designed one of these systems for action recognition with uh, kernel SDA, and that we had it run in real time in a Raspberry Pi, right? I mean, it's that simple. It's the, the amount of resources that you need for these methods are much, much, much better. Now, there is a lot of research these days on once these deep neural networks have been trained, how much can I compact them, reduce their size, and still get approximately the same results or, approx or close enough, right? There's a lot of research on that, but it's, st it's still unclear how much we can do. Okay, that was another question. Uh, why do we typically use Redu? Why not any of the other applications? Very good question, because of the same, it's the same answer for anything else in deep neural networks, because that's what works that people have tried a variety of different, so there are some theoretical reasonings for that, right? That it doesn't saturate as much as other, uh, others, uh, that if you use the sigmoidal, then you have problems with the negative numbers and not being well represented. Uh, with the 10 age doesn't have that problem, but it still has problems with saturation. Anyways, there are a lot of issues, um, but so does Revo, right? Uh, Relu doesn't represent negative numbers at all. There's another version that is called leak Relu, or L Relu, which actually, um, for a small numbers uh, or negative numbers or small numbers, you'll just multiply it by a scale, a very tiny, tiny scalar, right? Uh, and so on. There are many variants of that, and people have tried all of them. And for and this is very important. This is key to understand the neural network, right? For the databases on which these de neural networks have been tested, does activation functions work best? That doesn't mean that they're going to work best in the real world or that they're going to solve every single problem out, out there, right? They work for these data sets that I've talked about in face recognition and the ones I'll talk about you know, for object recognition. But what's going to happen in the real world, that's to be determined, right? Or whether these methods uh, are, going, are actually the solution that, that we're going to use. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. All right. So um, I'm going to switch here. Um, I'm going to use the slides for a moment, well, for the rest of the lecture. I'm going to use the slides because there's just no other way to show some of the things I'm going to show. And it will allow me to go a little faster as well because we're really running out of time. But I do want to talk uh, very briefly about a few more things that I want you to be aware for the recognition of or trying to understand emotions through facial expressions in other, uh, in other uh, nonverbal signals from humans. Uh, and then we'll do the same for object recognition, okay? All right, so as we said, facial expressions, nothing uh, very, um, very different from what uh, we are used to uh, call nonverbal communication, not very different from what we have done before. We're just interested in recognizing something that is physical. And in that case, it's the movement of the facial muscle articulations, right? Now, I want to clarify that that doesn't mean that this is an emotion. That just means this is a facial configuration, right? A facial expression, typically it's something that carries some meaning, okay? Um, so um, how does this work, right? So I showed you that in typically for action unit recognition, you need these shape uh, components, right? These shape features that describe the position of every fiducial point or landmark point on the face. And the reason this is important is because these facial expressions are analyzed or studied uh, based on the official configurations, right? And I'm going to show you a few images to, sh to convince you. So I'm going to, first, I'm going to show you two images in sequence. And I want you to tell me which of the two looks sadder, the first one or the second one, OK? Sadder, yeah, you tell me. All right, which one? Second one, very good. Um, and the reason for this is very strange because they're all neutral faces, right? There's no facial uh, muscle articulation. And that's the point, right? That uh, we humans are biased, right? And computers are biased too. 
And the, what happens here is that when we have a long distance between the brows and the mouth, we see an elongated face and we think that this person is expressing sadness when in fact that person is expressing absolutely nothing. And when this distance is decreased, that person looks like he's angry, right? But obviously he's not. He just happened to have a bonus structure that uh, creates that impression on us, right? And that's the bias that, um, that we have to be very aware of. And the, the larger this distance or the shorter this distance, the sadder and the angrier the face looks. So we have to be very careful with that. Uh, now, the reason this happens, because you might wonder, why on earth do we see a sad face or this face as a sad face if it's not a sad face? Well, because when you make a sad expression, that distance actually increases. And when you make an angry expression, that ang uh, distance actually decreases, right? So here you have in the x-axis, the baseline distance between the brows and the mouth compared to the average, right, to the mean. And you can actually design a computer vision system that gives you 100% classification accuracy between sad, true sad faces and true angry faces without any training data, without any type of uh, complicated uh, uh, design of machine learning or use of machine learning algorithms, right? Uh, this is very good. So this method works perfectly well, but you have to be aware that if someone has an uncanny distance between brows and mouth, that person is going to be classified as expressing sadness when in fact that person is not. And if it has a short, that person has a short distance between brows and mouth, we are going to classify it as expressing anger when in fact that person is not, right? So you're going to have a lot of false positives uh, because of that and humans do that. So here I'm going to show you an example. I um, don't know if you have been in Chicago, but if you are, go to the Art Institute uh, to see this uh, amazing painting by Wood, uh, American Gothic. And in that painting, there's this male character. This is just a crop of that painting, right? And this guy looks really sad, right? But look very closely. He's not moving a single facial muscle, right? Um, so we wondered a few years ago if we could l make him look angry. Um, and, you know, if you modify the bonus structure, just using warping software, uh, you can create this other face. So you just shorten the distance between the, brow the brows and the mouth and you make the face look wider and all of a sudden the person looks angry, right? So again, be very careful with all these biases. Um, so the reason this happens is because in your brain you have this algorithm that has m multiple dimensions of analysis, so like the feature space that we create in computer vision, right? Where we compute uh, the shape, the shape uh, vectors, the shading vectors, right? And they are supposedly orthogonal or quasi-orthogonal to one another. And when you are in this quadrant, right, you, your faces look sad. And when you're in this quadrant, your faces look angry, right? And so on. You see how this works? But it doesn't mean that the person is actually angry or the person is actually sad. It doesn't mean anything like that. It just means that that's your perception, right? Uh, now, we also wonder, uh, wondered uh, a few years ago what happened in these other quadrants, right? I mean, if that's really true, that in your brain you have this model, right? Uh, then uh, what would be a quadrant like this that has features that define the perception of anger and features that define the perception of sadness? So we wondered whether uh, there would be such a thing as a, oops, as a sadly angry expression, and people would perceive that. So we actually tested this, and actually these things do exist. People actually express a variety of what we, it's now well known as compound emotions, um, which is, you know, expressing happily surprised versus, ha versus happily disgusted, right? And you'll be happily surprised when you get an A plus in this course, uh, and you'll be happily disgusted when someone tells you a really funny but very disgusting joke. Right? There are two completely different scenarios. You have two completely different reactions. And so this, these things are actually, uh, they, they do exist. Um, uh, we didn't know about this until 2014 or so uh, when we published this work. Um, but now they are regularly used, right? Because we know that they exist. So um, here are, um, here's a slide that shows why the recognition of these action units in computer vision is so difficult. 
So for example, if you want to recognize action unit one, this is the inner corner uh, brow razor here, you will see that this occurs in a variety of facial expressions. So this facial expression has action unit one active, but this one also has action unit one active. If you can see it here, this one has also action unit one active. And you can see that both the shape and the shading of that region I have circled in yellow are very different, right? That's what makes these problems really hard. This is another example with a U20. Um, you see this is the corner, it's a mouth puller here, the corner of the mouth. And the texture or the shading and the shape of that corner varies dramatically from image to image, right? So that's what makes it really hard. So you, the goal is to find these underlying distributions that represent us, and this is the algorithm that I have um, defined in class. This is an example of one of um, the algorithms working on a video from the internet that my students, I guess, thought was very funny. These are actors actually moving the faces in real time that is slowly in pur on purpose. I, yeah, I don't know, right? I mean, this is, right, actors like, and you can see the algorithm is identifying. AU6 is the uh, cheek razor, AU12, the classical smile, uh, AU25, it's mouth open, right, and so on. So uh, AU9 is the wrinkle of the nose of disgust, right? The, that was a happily disgusted expression, actually, and so on, right? Um, you can also design um, these deep neural networks to reconstruct a face, uh, or at least the shape of the face, in 3D, right? Because if the face is rotated, these methods that I've introduced, remember, I have talked that you need to first align everything and frontalize that image, right? Because otherwise, you cannot do recognition in different poses. A better way to do that is to actually recover the 3D shape and work in 3D space, right? Calculate the distances or the shading properties in 3D space. And the way you do that is, by taking a database of Xs that are 2D images and Ys, which are the 3D landmark coordinates of these 2D images, okay? And then what you do is you learn the underlying function F that maps from this 2D to this 3D, right? Even better, what works even better is to use one that goes from a 2D image to 2D landmark points, which we have seen in detail in this class, well, in this course, um, and then have another network that goes from 2D to 3D, right? But you need training data for that. That means that you need to know the 3D shape of the faces of many people, right? Now, do you know of a method that you have studied, we actually studied in 5460, right, in the introductory class, uh, that you could use to recover the 3D shape of many people's faces? The structure from motion, right? So all you need to do is find enough videos of people moving their faces, uh, get good accurate, structure from motion is accurate enough, if you have good resolution, that you can extract good 3D uh, shapes from those faces, and then use it for training here. And now given just a 2D image, just a single image, you can recover the 3D shape, right? And uh, here, so here's an example of this. Um, here are results. Um, and the good thing about these, these things is that all the problems that you're going to encounter out there in the real world are like this, right? Everything can be solved using a combination of the methods that we have seen in 5460 the introductory class to image processing computer vision and this course advanced computer vision, right? Okay, there's just all a combination of all these different methods. Um, <clears throat> with this, um, we have collected over seven million images of faces. This is a huge data set called Emotionet and there's a competition that we run once in a while. Um, so uh, that's called the Emotionet Challenge to recognize these action units. Uh, these are the results from last year, I think. There's going to be a new competition we're going to run uh, this uh, coming year, uh, early 2020, in conjunction with CVPR. But uh, this was uh, an independent uh, one that we ran in 2018. 
And you can see the F1 scores. We did cover F1 score, right, uh, in class. You can see the F1 score is absolutely, I mean, not terrible, but not good, right? I mean, below 0 0.6, uh, 0.57 almost. It's pretty bad, right? So computer vision is still, to this day, far, far, far away from solving this problem. These problems are very, very difficult, right? Uh, so when you read on the news that um, computers are going to be super intelligent, are going to be more intelligent than humans in the foreseeable future, right? It's, we're almost there. Um, don't believe it. <laughs> we cannot even recognize action units right now, let alone make computers smarter than humans. Uh, so um, just to let you know, I'm not going to cover this, but uh, there's also a lot of research going on right now on uh, what's called weekly supervised learning of action units and many other problems in computer vision. And the reason for that is because annotating data is very expensive. So what you do is you take some annotation and you take other data that's not annotated, you combine it into a single data set, and then you try to use the annotations that you have in your data set to re-annotate the others that the other samples in the data set that are not annotated. And then you try to keep improving both the data set and the, the algorithm to annotate the data set in conjunction. So there's a lot of research on that. Uh, we had a paper in CVPR, um, let's say 2018. Um, it's still, this, these are things that are still in research that hopefully I'll cover in this course uh, two, three, four years from now, right? When we have more uh, or more and better results, but right now this is just things that are uh, being developed. Um, another very exciting thing, and I talk about this topic in my machine learning class. You may want to take a look at this because this is something also really cool and that is gaining a lot of uh, uh, ground or uh, it's going to take a lot of traction rather in research right now. It's uh, something uh, that's called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And this is part of the generative methods in machine learning. Now, generative methods, there's a huge number of generative methods in, in machine learning, but these deep neural networks that uh, emulate generative, or there's, there's a part of a generative methods, are very, very, very powerful to generate new fake images. Have you ever heard of deep fakes? That's where it comes from. These are the methods that do that, okay? And this is up and coming, still in research, but it's getting better by the day. Uh, again, it's in my machine learning <coughs> lectures. Go to YouTube if you haven't taken that course and look at this because this is incredible. This is an example of a paper that we <coughs> published just last year. So you see this first row here, um, the face uh, or the faces in that first row. All these faces are one and the same. It's just one face, okay? Just repeated multiple times. And that's a real face. That's a face we downloaded from the internet. Okay, it's a face from the EmotionNet data set. All right, <clears throat> now we design one of these GAN networks to change the image to activate one of the action units. So each column here corresponds to an action unit, right? So first column corresponds to action unit one here. So you can see that as I go down, I have an image that has the, uh, the inner corners of the eyebrows moving upwards from less to more. You see that? How the eyebrows are curving up. And AU2 is the outer corners of the brows curving up, right? You see that? AU12, it's a classical smile. So you see how the lips are curving in the classical smile, right? Uh, 25, it's mouth open. So you see the mouth being opened, right? Now, all these images are fake. They don't exist. These are images that the algorithm just has edited, right? Um, so now you can ask the algorithm to, given a real image, this is a real image in, in the um, green mark or square here, um, give me a sequence of that person a smiling, with classical smile with mouth open, that's AU12 plus 25. And this is the fake sequence that the algorithm gives you, right? I mean, uh, it's crazy, right? Uh, this is still not good enough for real time, but I think, again, another two, three, four years, uh, this is going to be actually pretty scary stuff, right? So there are two things that are being developed right now 
in computer vision and machine learning. One, A, is thus, algorithms like this that can edit the image or generate new fake images, right? The so-called deep fakes in the media. And the second one is algorithms that can detect whether an image or a video is fake or real. And they are hand in hand. This is like the doping in the Olympics, right? Uh, people come up with new doping mechanisms and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the associations that run the Olympics or the sports associations, right, have to develop anti-doping mechanisms to detect whether you are doping, right? And they go hand in hand and one goes a little more advanced and then the other and it's, uh, we'll see what happens. But this is going to be a very challenging um, problem for us in the next years to come. And obviously, uh, as I said, I don't have time for a lecture on ethics and, and the law, but this is one of the areas where this is uh, going to become uh, really key. Uh, or really problematic, rather. Okay, this is the network. I'm, I don't have time. Well, maybe I'll give you a very brief, very, very brief description. We're going to run of out of time. But so basically, you have a network that ha has as input the real image, a vector where you have negative ones, AU not active, positive ones, AU active, as I've given before. And then you have two networks here. One that says how each pixel has to be changed, and another network which pixels have to be changed and which ones have not to be changed, right? Now, the way this works is at the beginning, this network does random things. It does completely nonsense, right? And the image that you get here is completely absurd. But then you have another network here that does classification, like the networks that we have already seen to do classification like the ones for recognition of identity or action units that we just introduced, right? Same networks. So you have a network that determines whether this image looks like a real image or not. And how, do you, how does this network know that? Well, because you have the real images, right? So you can train this network to discriminate between real images and fake images, right? So when this network detects that this is a fake image, this uh, other network called the generator is penalized with a loss function. And you use gradient descent to change the weights of that network such that this image becomes as good as possible to trick that classifier called the discriminator. Okay? And then this is iterated until this is generating really good images, right? Now, how do you know that you are generating the action units that you want to generate. What you do is, now that you have generated this image, you can pass, put it back here and ask it to generate the image with the original action units, right? And then you will know whether you can actually generate an image with the original action units because you have the original image. <laughs> so it's a simple a square loss at the end, right? that you can determine. So you can train these networks. Now I'm making it look really simple here. It's complicated, but you can train these networks, OK? All right, one more thing. Well, a couple more things. Facial expressions do not only include facial muscle articulations, right? Remember, this is one of the, uh, the ways that we communicate nonverbally. We actually move uh, the, the facial muscles, right? But another way by which we communicate other nonverbal signals like emotions. So let's say that I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy and I may want to move my corners of the mouth if I want to, right? And show you that, yeah, what you said to me was funny and or I made me happy, right? But when I experience an emotion, there are many computations that are executed by my central nervous system some of these competitions are the release of what's called peptides, okay? Peptides includes hormones and other types of peptides, right? Like cortisol, testosterone, and so on. And that actually changes the blood flow and the blood composition in your body. And it turns out that the face, it's innervated with this huge number of blood vessels, right? This face that we have here is innervated with this huge number of blood vessels that are on top of the facial muscles, right? And this uh, blood flow actually is visible from the outside as a color change, right? So you can design computer vision systems to actually recognize that. 
to recognize these facial color changes to detect what people are experiencing. Uh, so in order to do that, you have to define this in what's called the isoluminant color space, okay? So I covered this briefly in, uh, image, uh, in the introduction to image processing and computer vision, but let me review this very quickly to give you an idea what this is. Now, we start obviously with an RGB camera because this is color. Uh, so we have each pixel defined by three channels. So each pixel is given by a three-dimensional vector with R, G, and B, right? So this is the pixel X, R, G, B, okay? So far so good. And that defines uh, th both the color and the luminance or the shading, right, of the image. So the luminance, you can get it from this as a linear combination, right? So if you were to convert this image into gray scale, you just do a linear combination of these three, right? And this linear combination gives you the shading like this. This is the shading. The shading, remember, gives you the shape, defines the shape of the object, right? All right, isoluminant color are the two dimensions orthogonal to luminance. Remember, this is a three-dimensional pixel, right? Or each pixel is fine, three-dimensional space. Uh, one dimension defines the luminance, and the other orthogonal two dimensions define the color, okay? And there are many color models that we discussed in uh, 5460 that uh, you could use to define these two dimensions, right? Uh, one of the most famous, famous ones is the opponent color model because this is what's believed that humans use, which has the red, green, and the blue, yellow channels. And this is how it works. I start with this image. From this image, I can compute the luminance. That's the luminance, right? The shading. And the two color channels. And this, again, would be the red, green, and the blue, yellow uh, channel. Okay. Now, if I convert these three images to black and white, to gray scale, right? I give you these three images in MATLAB. You apply RGB to gray, right? What is it going to happen? The first image is going to be identical, but the other two images are going to be blank. Why? Because there's no shading information here, right? There's no luminance. Every pixel has the exact same luminance. Uh, there's no shade, there's only color information, right? So what you want to do when you work with color alone is do not use the top image, right? The top information, only use these two vectors, right? Or two matrices of information to build a computer vision system. So in our case here, we could do that um, as we did before. You detect these landmark points. And with these landmark points, you can create a tessellation, right? A division of regions. Uh, this is uh, one of these uh, standard tessellation uh, methods that you can apply to your landmark points. And then from each local area here, you can extract, for example, statistics of the color, like the mean, the standard deviation, the mode, you name it, right? Whatever. And create a feature vector. And then use one of the methods that we have talked about, PCA, ICA. Uh, LDA, kernel versions of that, or a deep neural network, right, to train the system to discriminate between the facial colors associated to specific categories, like, you know, when I'm happy, when I'm angry, when I experience some pain, etc. right? And this is results for uh, that uh, some students of mine ran for some emotion categories. Uh, when you're expressing this in a communicative uh, sense so that people know that they want to communicate with you certain uh, compound emotions. And classification accuracy is very good, as you can see. It's mostly above 70%, right? So you can actually communicate uh, these signals even with just a color, even without having to, to read the action units. All right. Um, you can do that with functions as well. We haven't talked much about this uh, here in this course, but everything that we have done, remember from 5460, everything we have done for tensors, we can do for functions, right? Because function can be defined in a functional space, and then you have the coefficients, right? The coefficient vector, the coefficient tensor, and everything applies uh, equally. All right. <clears throat> now, I want to emphasize that not everyone who smiles is happy, 
and not everyone who is happy smiles. There is so much bad science out there these days. There's just so many companies and researchers claiming that technology can detect or knows whether you're happy or not, or whether you're angry or not. This is not possible, people. It's impossible to know whether someone you're looking at is happy or not. It's absolutely physically impossible because many people, I would even amend this, I would say most people that smile are not happy. And I don't know if most, but many people that do not smile are happy, right? So it's just not, this is not a one-to-one -one mapping here, right? So we have to be cognizant of this. And um, here's an, ooh, all right. Well, one image disappeared um, on me, but uh, here are two examples. You have that in the slides, but here's an example. What do you think that this woman or this girl is expressing? Everyone I ask says sadness, right? And there's a face of an angry guy here, right? And everyone says angry. And these are very negative emotions, right? But when you see the real images, right? That is the face that's missing there. You can see it's an angry expression. But did you say this person is angry? No, he's celebrating, right? He's really happy. Uh, would you say that this girl is really sad? No, he's super happy, right? He's, she's looking at, I don't know, some idol or some, I don't know who, but, but anyways, they are super happy. Um, so analyzing the world, right? This high, high level task that humans do so effortlessly is very difficult, right? It's not as simple as, oh, I can detect the blood flow change. Oh, I can detect the action units, yes. But can you detect the body pose? Can you understand the context? Not only detect what the context is, but understand what that context means. Do you know the situation this person is situated in? Do you know the culture of that person? And so on and so forth. If you don't have all that information, there is absolutely no way you're going to interpret this as humans do, right? So this is a very difficult problem. And um, I just want you to be super aware of that. All right, any questions before I move on? Yeah, question. Can you use infrared cameras to detect facial color Yes, you can, absolutely. Um, you can detect many more things with infrared cameras. That's one of the good things about computer vision, that the visual systems that we can use go beyond what humans uh, can do, right? We have uh, infrared cameras, we have ultraviolet cameras, right? Uh, we have cameras and other sensors that look at different uh, areas of the band, right, of the electromagnetic uh, wavelength, right? And humans can only see the visible spectrum, right, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny portion. Uh, so obviously you can use all of this. There, there are um, companies that design computer vision systems to detect whether um, these machines that take the peat out of the olives have actually succeeded in every olive, right? And what do you use to do that? Well, you use some type of X-ray or I don't know what, right? That actually sees through. A human cannot do that task, right? So absolutely, um, use those uh, devices as much as you can because they are good. Now, the problem is in, some, in many of these applications, um, you want to use uh, the technology that humans have already with them, right? Like this camera on my cell phone. And if I want to do that, then I'm restricted to that particular type of camera. So you have to know what's my application and what are my restrictions. But otherwise, yeah, fire away. Any other questions? All right, so let's uh, move on then. Um, and we're gonna go back to object recognition, okay? So we have uh, maybe two, three more topics that I wanna cover briefly uh, in this last, um, what is it uh, now? Two and a half lectures, probably less, right? Uh, but I wanna go back to object recognition. We've covered a lot of object recognition, but now I wanna tell you, uh, as I did with faces, about the databases or some of the databases because there are dozens of data sets out there, but some of the databases that there are out there, the famous ones, 
and some of the latest algorithms that have achieved the best results on these data sets, okay? Does not mean they are necessarily general, general, gener, generally the best ones overall? All right, so again, um, when we do recognition of objects, uh, objects appear in a variety of contexts and complexities, right? So it's very different to do recognition in this tiny data set, uh, very toy data set that I gave you in one of your projects, right? Of your homework uh, versus this one, right? Detecting that there is a flute here uh, or that this is a backpack is seen from, you know, the backside uh, or that there is a bathing cap in this streamer, right? Or that there is a racket, that there's a ball, that this is a matchstick and so on, right? Um, these things are complicated, right? These are difficult problems. Uh, all these started in the 1990s, right? Uh, mid to late 1990s. Um, as I said, uh, face recognition was first with eigenfaces and uh, all these other algorithms that we have seen. But later, that was, or shortly after, that was applied to object recognition. And that's one of the very first attempts to do that. And these are the actual objects that were used uh, for uh, this particular research in 90, that was published in 95. They would take these wooden objects, place them in a rotating table, right? And had the robot arm with a point source illumination, right? <laughs> and that robot arm would illuminate that object from uh, multiple angles, right? In that hemisphere. Remember the hemisphere from 5460? So that would allow you to take images with a camera at each possible rotation of that object for each possible illumination, okay? Now, when I project this, say, in PCA space, right? Let's imagine that I take PCA and I project these images that I'm taking to PCA space. What's gonna happen in PCA space? Okay, this image, right, is the pixels projecting PCA space. Maybe it's going to correspond to that point right here in PCA space, okay? You see that point right here? That's that image. Now, as I rotate that table, that point is gonna move in that PCA space. Now, when I rotate just one, one degree, the new image is gonna be very close to the previous one because the images are almost identical, right? So it's gonna be maybe this one. Then I rotate another degree, it's gonna be this one, and then another degree. And as I rotate, this image is gonna define a path in that PCA space until I go back to it because I rotate 360 degrees, right? Now, what I do, I move the illumination, right? So I move the illumination by a small degree, and then instead of going in this direction, it's gonna go maybe in that direction, right? And then I rotate the table again, and it's going to move in that direction. And then I rotate another little bit, the illumination is gonna go further this way, and I rotate the table, and it's gonna go around again, and it's creating that manifold, right? And that's a manifold we wanna learn, right? This is our function f, our underlying function f that maps f of x to y, right? That's that underlying function that we generally want to learn. Now, this is one of the toy uh, data sets that you had in one of your homeworks, right? This is an original uh, data set, the ETH80, that was inspired in that previous work that I just showed you, right? But this was with more realistic objects. And in particular, this is done for what's called object categorization, okay? So categorization means that I'm trying to recognize categories like cows, cars, pears, dogs, and so on, rather than specific uh, breeds or identities of objects, right? I'm not interested in my car versus your car, but just a car, right? Or an SUV versus a sedan, but just a car. Uh, and I'm interested in dogs versus cats, not which particular breed of a dog or a cat, right? Um, so in this data set, you have, for each category, you have many different objects, right, of the same category, different cows in that case, and for each cow, you have different views of that cow, right? And then in the early 2000s, that was, again, from uh, late, I think early 2000s, this data set, 
and in the early to mid 2000s, we were achieving about 75% accuracy on this data set, this very simplistic data set, right? Oh, which was pretty good at the time. Uh, now, uh, moving forward to the early 2010s, by the early 2010s, uh, there was an interest in complicating things, and Pascal VOC, uh, that stands for uh, Object uh, Classification, or Very Large Object Classification, or Visual Object Classification, rather, uh, was done on real images like this with an manual annotations uh, in bounding boxes like this, where you have a bounding box that specifies this is a motorcycle, and a bounding box specifying there is a human here. Now, note this is just a bounding box, right? The human is not the whole bounding box, but just a portion of that bounding box. Probably not even 30% of the pixels of that bounding box correspond to a person. But that's how this is annotated, OK? Um, and then there is another component, which is a segmentation, right? Image segmentation. And in image segmentation, you actually have the outline of what is the person and what is the motorcycle, right? And these are two classical problems that we have seen in this class uh, that we can address. So this was uh, one of the original, uh, the very first big paper was in 2010 um, that started uh, this new revolution of large uh, data sets. Now, this data set um, contained 20 different object classes, right? which is not that many, but you know, it's better than 10 that we had in the ETH-80, and over 22,000 manually annotated images, which is a lot, right? Um, the next big thing was ImageNet. Larger scale, and uh, ImageNet came with the larger scale visual recognition challenge, which uh, was a challenge. It's now still ongoing, but now uh, Kegel has taken over and it's just like for, um, I don't know, I get record keeping purposes, right? It's just ended a few years ago. But um, this uh, challenge and the ImageNet took what Pascal VOC was doing to a next level, right? And the idea was if we want to design algorithms that would really well, we need to to create very, very, very large data sets because we need both to be able to, to, um, to test how accurate these algorithms work and these algorithms need to know what these objects really look like in the real world, right? So there, is, uh, this, uh, there was this synergy between the two components of that. Uh, the ImageNet uh, original, or at one point, I think it was probably around uh, 2015, if I'm not mistaken. It grew up to 22,000 categories. So now we've gone from you know, a few dozen categories to thousands of categories and 15 million images, right? I mean, think about the size of this for a second. Um, now, obviously, how do you do that? Right? I mean, this is insane. So first you need to download these images, which is a big uh, problem. The way this is done, you use dictionaries, right? You use a dictionary, this is a, a famous dictionary, it's called WordNet, that's why this is called ImageNet. This is like the other uh, data set that I mentioned earlier, it's called EmotionNet. Because this WordNet was the original paper that organized the words in the English dictionary as a graph, actually as a tree where you have synonyms and antonyms and uh, uh, words that are subordinates of other words, right? So dog could be uh, the, uh, the father of uh, several leaves or children that would uh, correspond to breeds of dogs, right? And my dog and your dog and so on, right? Um, and, and you use this word net to extract uh, to use uh, these words that are organized in a useful way to obtain or download images from the internet by using these words as keywords in a search engine. Okay? And now you collect millions and millions of images. But now you need to annotate these millions of images. How do you do that? Now, until 
around 2010, 2012, right? That was impossible. We couldn't do that. It's completely impossible. But then something amazing happened. Amazon, that's Amazon the company, <laughs> uh, the company used probably to buy many of your things, right? Uh, came up with a tool, it's called Amazon Mechanical Chirk. And this is a place where you can ask people in the world to do tasks for you that can be done on a computer and you pay them a little amount of money. And these people that were creating ImageNet thought, this is perfect, this is the perfect tool we're waiting for. So they put that in Amazon Mechanical Turk, they put uh, the images and people had to uh, draw the bounding boxes around the different objects in the image and annotate what object that was. And it took years of work. And during these years, they recruited 49,000 people around the world to annotate these millions of images. <laughs> and these people came from 167 different countries, and it took them more than three years to complete this. Uh, but now this famous, now famous data set was created, and we had objects, uh, images of objects in a variety of, uh, of domains, like uh, uh, different sizes, right? So this is an orange that looks like this versus an airliner, right? That looks this is small. That we know, humans know, that these are different scales, but computer doesn't, right? Um, different textures of the objects, right? Uh, different deformability. So for example, this is a non-deformable object versus this is a highly deformable object, right? A mon monkey can deform uh, in many ways, whereas a canoe can only deform if you break it, right? And so on and so forth. Um, so very successful, very uh, good data set, very interesting data set. It also, the data set was built in a way that you have categories of objects, like we said, cars, bottles, birds, but you also have s very specific types of uh, categories or identities, like flamingo, or a cock, or a uh, grouse, or a quail, or a whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, and later on, people have actually compared uh, the best object recognition algorithms, computer vision algorithms, in this data set with humans, against humans. And humans are better at these big categories, right? But computers are better at these other categories. Why? Because if you give me an image of this bird, I'm not going to be able to give you the name because I have no idea what this is, right? But the computer does <laughs> because it's been trained to do so. So that's why computers appear to be better, right? It's not that they are better. It's that they have been trained to recognize this type of bird. I have not, right? So anyway, same for bottles, same for cars, right? So you, you have all these different uh, types of categories. I encourage you to go online and check the website. Uh, everything is very well organized. You can search by categories. Uh, it gives you all the images. So here's an example, right? You can search for this specific type of flower, and it'll give you all the different images that they have of that flower. Uh, and this is the size of Pascal VOC that I've mentioned before. It's about 30,000 images. It's just this box here. Uh, this is the box of ImageNet. <laughs> 50 million images. That's absolutely enormous. In their competition, the way that they uh, determine whether your algorithm uh, actually detects or recognizes the object in the image, the object of interest in the image, is by asking the algorithm to output the five most likely objects in that image. Five most likely objects, okay? This is called top five. Top one would be just give me the most likely. Top two, the most, two most likely. Top five, the five most likely. If the true, the steel drum, for example, this one, if the true category is in your top five, then this is considered correct classification. If it's not, then this is an incorrect classification, okay? And that's how you do the, uh, uh, the rec uh, excuse me, the analysis with the zero one loss, right? If you get it correctly here, it's a one. If you don't, it's a zero. And then you sum over all the samples or the testing samples that you run it through, okay? 
So for example, here in that case, if, uh, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is the second task, this is localization. In the localization task, you're asked to draw a bounding box around a specific class, right? So for example, steel drum gives me the bounding box, and this is the bounding box of the steel drums here, right? And then if the overlap between the ground truth and the, the output of the algorithm, it's at least 50%, that is considered an okay uh, detection, okay? An acceptable detection. Otherwise, considered incorrect. That's it. It's that simple, right? Uh, also, if, uh, so, so here you see this here, right? So if you say this is where the drum is and the drum is this, right? There is enough overlap to say this is good classification. But if your bounding box is this one, then this one is m less than 50% overlap, right? And therefore, this is an incorrect classification. Okay, you see how this works? Okay, so again, uh, you use a zero one loss. And then there are other, um, there are other ones that are used. Um, there's a task three for detection, uh, allows evaluation of generic object detection in clutter scenes like this. Uh, more information uh, you have here in the slide, and uh, do go to the ImageNet uh, website, and you'll see this. This is just uh, what is said. The percentage has to be a larger of 0.5, right, or equal. And then again, you know, if you are 0.49, you pass, and if you are 0.50001, you don't, right? So, I mean, there's a harsh. Uh, boundary there that, that determines whether an algorithm is good or not. So you have to take all these caveats into account when you read what the results are, right? Because the results, when you read this news that, oh my gosh, computers are so good, they are doing these amazing things. Well, yeah, but these are the metrics that we use to evaluate these algorithms, right? Now, can you guess why the uh, authors of that work decided to use these metrics, which are very uh, uh, very good metrics, right, for, for us, the designers of these algorithms to work with. Why did they decide to be so pessimistic with the design of these metrics? Anyone has a guess? Because even with these metrics, the algorithms of the time perform extremely poorly. <laughs> on this image uh, data set, right? Absolutely horrendous, right? Now the problem is, now, now the algorithms perform really well, but on this metric still, right? <laughs> when you improve the metrics, when you create metrics that are more realistic, the algorithms stop working, or, or they still work, but they don't work as well as they claim, or people think they should work, okay? Um, so these are our old results. Um, so this is uh, the first three competitions, the number of people that participated. So you can see the first year about 20, probably about 30 people participated, right? Then everyone had absolutely horrendous results. So the next year almost no one participated. It's like, what's the point, right? <laughs> and then in 2012, um, yeah, then people said, okay, well, give it a second shot. Uh, it, it worked a little better. We'll, we'll see that more detail next, in next lecture. Uh, but by 2013, there were already 81 people interested, right? Things have started to work. And by 2014, uh, people actually knew how to solve this problem for this particular data set. And when that happened, right, when someone finally found the key to make it work, to make our algorithms work on this data set, then there was an explosion, right? And that has continued to this day. So much so that uh, last week there was the deadline for submitting papers to our main conference. As you know, I've mentioned this many times, it's called CVPR, Computer Vision Power Recognition Conference. And Word on the street, don't quote me on that, but it's that uh, we have received about 10,000 submissions, right? That's a lot of submissions. <laughs> and that's because 
people have found ways to actually make the algorithms work on these particular data sets that I'm talking about, uh, that I'm discussing here. That doesn't mean that we've solved the object recognition problem, right? Or any other problem in computer vision for that matter. It just means that we know how to solve some specific problems, right? Some limited problems. I'll talk more about this uh, on Thursday. All right, see you then. <laughs>